Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Happy Halloween everyone, I hope you're all having a great night. For tonight's show, we're going to get straight to the encounters and not have any interview questions. Before we bring on tonight's guest though, understand that because of her job in law enforcement, she wants to keep her identity hidden. With that in mind, I'm going to keep her name anonymous and I've ditched till the altered her voice. All right, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right to it. I'm from a very small town near the coast of South Carolina, so near Myrtle Beach, um, about an hour outside of Myrtle Beach. And I have been an avid deer hunter since I was probably five or six years old. I go with my dad. We have private property where we hunt that's owned by my family. My uncle... My great uncle, my dad and I are the only ones who really hunt occasionally with my cousin. And we have been hunting on this property, like I said, for years. It's been, I think the property has been in our family for probably around 30 or 40 years. We do a lot of farming, tobacco, cotton, that kind of thing. Uh, My grandmother owns an entire acres upon acres of farming land and this land is separate so it's in a different location than where we farm but we still go and we plant corn or we plant cotton during the summer so that when deer season comes around probably uh, September 1st I believe is when our deer season starts we can have the corn and the cotton and everything planted out there we do uh, field plots and that type of thing for the upcoming season. And we also put out field cameras during the summer so we can see what we're looking forward to uh, beginning of deer season. So this property has always been, I wouldn't say that you get kind of a weird feeling whenever you begin or whenever you get there, but I have always had kind of an off, especially when I was younger, kind of an off feeling when you get there, especially because whenever we hunt, what we like to do is we'll either go in the morning and arrive to the land well before daylight, or we'll stay very, very late in the afternoon, well after dark. So you're always in the tree stand or you're going to or coming from the tree stand in the dark. And I've never really been one who's been afraid of the dark as far back as I can remember. But I've always had kind of an eerie feeling, especially on this land. And I'll tell you why. The most important thing to remember is that it is family land. So we have had multiple family members who have been on this land who have passed their experiences down on through different family members, and it's gotten back to me. And I think that that's important because we kind of push tradition there. And even though some of the experiences can be skewed different ways they all tend to have the same focal point and they all tend to be about the same type of sighting about the same type of creature now i've had family members who have insisted that what what has been seen on the fields as like a a black panther because i know there have been sightings here in south carolina or a bigfoot type creature And I've never really thought that either of those were plausible because of the descriptions that I've been told and because of what I have seen and what I've heard. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about the land itself, the property itself. We have two separate hunting properties. They're about a mile apart from each other, if if that. The first one that you come upon first is a, a lane. So it's a straight lane back about a half a mile into the woods. Um, And there's a tree stand at the end of this lane that looks out over a giant field. I couldn't tell you how big it is, actually. But it looks out over a giant field, and there's a what's called like tripod tree stand there at the very end of that lane that overlooks the field. This lane is surrounded by younger trees, so it has grown up a little bit it's fairly taller than i am the brush around you whenever you're walking up 
So if you're walking from the beginning of this lane down to the tree stand, like I said, it's about a half a mile. And there is a lot of foliage on either side of you. And there's a ground blind, which is a kind of like a box blind that's made of, of plywood to your left, about a half halfways down the lane. And there are two or three shooting lanes there on either side. And then you walk down and get to the actual tree stand, which is at the end. And that's where I like to hunt. Now, we have been, each season, we'll shift back between which two properties that we hunt. But this one is the, the actual lane. We, we call it the lane, actually. And it has been a big source of our deer population this season so far. It's been really the only place that I've hunted this season. Now, the other hunting property, which has also been a big source of some of our sightings, has a different layout entirely. So we have a um, property that has three different tree stands on it. Now, mind you, this property has corn and cotton planted on it. It has, like I said, three tree stands. One is what I'll refer to as the front tree stand. So it's about 100 feet from the road, and it overlooks a big field. So the second tree stand is a little bit farther back. You have to walk through the first field to get to the second tree stand, and it overlooks an entirely different field. So this field is a little bit bigger. It has, I believe, corn planted in it right now. Every year it changes. We'll do corn, we'll do cotton, we'll switch it up like that. And then there is a dirt path from the second tree stand that leads down to the third, which is a little bit further back into the woods. And the thing to remember about this area is that from the second to the third, like I said, there's a, uh, a long dirt path that you have to walk down. Walking down this path, I'm going to tell you, at night, or in the darkness is quite a different experience on its own, especially if you go out there on your own, you know, and you're having to go through these first two fields on your own and then go back to the back. Now, what's important to remember about the third tree stand is that when you walk down this dirt path, you go down, I would say about a half a mile down the dirt path. And then there is a, you know, the dirt path is next to the corn, all that growth there. And to your left is just more of that upgrowth of that, um, you know, younger trees and places where we've bush hogged and little shooting lanes, but it's not forested. Now, there is a certain patch of forest. When you walk down about a half a mile down this dirt path, that you'll, you'll come to a, a little patch of thick forest there. And you have to cross over a ditch, which we have a like a plank or a piece of plywood set up to cross this ditch, and to get into the forested area, which is right there on the edge. Now, what was funny about this, and I tell this to people all the time, I like to tell them this story because it interests me and I have a father. My father is one who is very funny. He's a hilarious guy. He loves to laugh and joke and pick with you, you know. And he's told me this story since I was very little. And I asked him before I talked to you if it was okay if I shared this story. He said, yeah, absolutely. That's fine with me. And he kind of went over everything else that happened. Now, listening to him tell the story is a whole different encounter on its own because he likes to make light of it. Because I was little, and when he first told me this story, he kind of wanted to give it like a comical viewpoint, kind of make me laugh about it. But I can remember, and I've told people this over the years, the same story, and it hasn't changed. And my father, like I said, he's a funny guy, but when he, tells the story, it is 100% truth. Some of the things that he says, some of the stories that he tells, I don't really take to heart, but this one is, is one that I wholeheartedly believe that he saw what he says he saw. So the first 
kind of story that I'd like to go into takes place on this land with the three different tree stands. And what's interesting about this is that my father has told me over the years, and I know it may sound crazy to some people, but my father has told me over the years, we don't go hunting on Sundays. Some people have this tradition that they just don't like to hunt on Sundays because it's the Lord's Day and that type of thing. And I've always went with it. You know, that's fine. I don't hunt on Sundays mostly because of work and, and different things like that. But also because my dad doesn't hunt on Sundays. It's just been something that we just don't do. So the way that my dad likes to tell the story is he was younger. And at this time, he was driving a little small F-150, a little red truck, a much older one. So if you know the older vehicles, they're, they're a little bit smaller. And it was a stick shift. And he drove this so that he could get out into the fields in order to get to the tree stand whenever it was wet or it was soggy or, you know, it had these big mud tires on it. So he was able to get back there and access this place a lot easier. And his story starts off with he was going hunting one morning and he decided from the way that he tells it, he decided, hey, it's a Sunday morning, but I really want to go hunting. It's no clouds in the sky. It's beautiful morning. Um, the stars are very bright. And I don't know if you know this, Vic, but I know there are some hunters who will agree with me. Full moon, when it gets closer to the full moon, it's a whole lot easier or a whole lot better to hunt on those days. Now, I know that a lot of people associate full moons with werewolves and that type of thing. And growing up, I always felt eerie going out there during a full moon. Now, I know it's one of the best times to hunt. It's been in our family to go hunting on a full moon. I can tell you that also being a part of law enforcement, that full moons you're going to see a lot crazier people during the time of the full moon. I think that anybody that works in law enforcement can tell you this as well. It's just a known thing. People get crazier, and you can always tell when it's getting close to a full moon when you start getting these crazy cases coming in. And uh, I work with victims, so I see that very often. A lot of my cases are clustered around where the full moon is. So that's that's just something that, that some background information on that. But my dad did say that it was a full moon and it was very early in the morning. Now, sun comes up around this time, but around seven or so. My dad and I like to get out there around 530, get in the tree stand by about 530, just so everything around us can kind of settle. And if there are any, any deer that are going to come out and come to our corn they're going to come out after everything's settled and they're not suspicious of anything any predators in the area or anything like that so my dad's story starts at this like i said at the field with the three tree stands and he says that that morning he got up and went out there about five or so got to the field about five thirty. said he drove he actually drove through the first and second fields back to where the third tree stand is. And we can do this sometimes if it's not too wet and too groggy. And if we get out there early enough, we can drive back there, no problem. Um, and that just makes it a little bit easier so we don't have to walk as far in the dark or we don't have to, if we do get a, a kill, we don't have to drag it that far or anything like that. So my dad says he drives back to this area where the little forest is that you have to walk through. Now. With this forest, because we don't like to have flashlights flying all over the place when you're walking through this patch of forest, there are actually beer cans, crushed beer cans that have been there for I can't tell you how long that line the path to this tree stand. And people always ask me, well, it's easier if you can just, you know, have a red light on or something like that walking through the woods and you can see the cans lined up so that you don't lose your way or end up coming out to the front of the field and spook anything that's out there. So my dad says he walks or he gets across the plank, 
uh, that goes over the ditch, starts walking through the woods, actually gets up over the little incline to where the tree stand is. Now, it's not a, a long walk through the woods, but it is kind of difficult with the trees and the branches and the, the undergrowth and stuff like that. So you have to be real careful when you're walking. So it's probably a 10 minute walk through the trees and the forest. And he says that he gets to the tree stand, which is probably about 15 to 20 feet up off the ground in a tree. And it overlooks this giant field. And there's four corners. You know, you look to your left and there's a far left corner, far right corner. And then there's a closer left and a closer right corner. So set up like a rectangle. And the tree stand itself looks out over this rectangle. Now, from what he says, he gets makes it to the tree stand, gets up there, sets himself up, gets his gun loaded and then put on safety and puts it aside. We always do it like that. Always have your gun loaded, but on safety. So he puts it to the side, pulls out his binoculars, sets everything up and sits there and takes a couple of smoke breaks and just kind of waits for the sun to come up a little bit to where you can see out of this field. And it probably takes, it's closer to 6, 15 or so before you can, what we call daybreak, when the sun just starts to come up enough to where you can see out over the field. And what happened this Sunday morning is something, and like I said, I, I believe this 100% because the story has never changed with my dad. He will tell you this story over and over and over, and it will never change. It's always the same. He claims that he has no idea what he saw this morning. No idea. But he will tell you in description about what he saw. So after he sat and loaded his gun and sat there for a little bit, smoking some cigarettes, the sun barely starts to come up to where you can barely see across the field. Well, he says he's looking and he's kind of got the binoculars up and he's looking around the field to be able to see what he can see out there a little bit easier. And he says the most interesting thing, he says that two does come out of the upper left-hand corner of the field. Now, there's a corn pile there and a camera set up. So he says that he's he's sitting there and he's watching, and all of a sudden he sees these two does come out of the left-hand corner of that field wide open. They're running in full sprint. Now, I don't know if everybody knows about how easy it is to spook deer, but you can tell when a deer is being, just when it's just running, just to run, or it's heard a noise and it's run, or it's being chased by something. Now, we have no natural predators other than coyotes in our area that we hunt. There's really no natural predators, no cougars. We've heard rumors of a black panther before, but that was years and years and years ago. And if you know what a black panther looks like, you know that it's got a long tail and it runs on all fours, you know. It's a very different kind of creature than what my dad claims that he saw. Now, in the corner of that field, we saw these two does running out. It, it kind of alarms him because he says to himself the same thing I said. They don't run like that unless they're getting chased by something, which is kind of off-putting in itself. You know, if you see these two deer just come barreling out of the, the corner of these woods that, that you're watching, and it's still pretty much dark, you barely make out this kind of thing. So my dad says he sits there and waits for a minute and watches the corner where these does have just run out of. And I, he will swear to you, Vic, Now my dad is not a supernatural person. We are Christians, and we do believe in, in supernatural beings, you know, evil spirits and stuff like that. And I was grown, or I grew up hearing that there is a spirit world around us and there are evil things around us, but the good Lord makes it to where we don't see that because if we did, then it would drive us crazy. It'd be the most terrifying thing ever. And I believe that wholeheartedly. But what my dad says that he saw 
come out of the corner of these woods, came out on two feet, running after these does. He said it was big and it was very, very, very dark. It's fur, what he assumes to be fur, is very, very dark color. He can't really make out much other than its its eyes. He says that his eyes were a, a yellow, had a, like a yellow tint to them. And he says he sees it come barreling out after these does on two feet. But the crazy part about it is, and what really alarmed him, was as it was running after these does, whatever it was, was running after these does on two feet, suddenly about midway through the field, it drops down into four feet. And he said that this, this couldn't be a bear because it was running almost human-like on two feet through this field before it dropped down into four, almost human-like. So he, you can see a bear on film, or if you've ever seen them you know, in real life, when they're on two feet, they kind of stagger a little bit. They look kind of awkward. But whatever this was that was on two feet was running perfectly like a human, and it was unnaturally fast. He said that the thing that surprised him the most was just how fast it was, running on two feet, dropping down to four and chase these deer actually in the direction he was sitting. Now, if if you're looking out over this field, if you're my dad in this situation, you're looking out over to the far left-hand corner of the field, and you're seeing this giant, dark-colored creature running on two legs and dropping down into four legs, running after two does, and they're running... The does are running in your direction, so of course, whatever this creature is, is also running kind of in your direction. Now, if you're sitting in the tree stand looking out of the field, my dad's trunk would have been behind him and to his right, kind of maybe about 100 yards back where his truck was parked. Now, the way that he says it, has always, it's always made me laugh how, how he talks about it, but you can tell when he does talk about it that it's something that spooked him. My dad is a very hardworking, you know, down to earth guy. So for something to really spook him to where he wants to get out of that tree, I know it's something serious. And I know that, like I said, he has never changed the story. So he said he sees this thing come out that's running after these does and he's in total shock as he sits there for about five minutes just thinking what have I just seen what is this I have no idea what this could be I've never seen anything like this before and we're from a very very small town so you know that's all he knew was coyotes and, and stuff like that we just didn't we don't have big predators like that and I asked him actually yesterday I said do you, do you remember if there were any noises any crickets chirping were there any owls anything like that that you would hear on a normal morning and he says you know i never thought about that but i do remember that it was very quiet that morning it was also a full moon and everything is kind of really active during a full moon you know you can hear the the owls hooting and the squirrels and everything they're moving around because they've got a little bit more light to see well, he's told me yesterday, he said, you know, I didn't really think about it, but thinking back now, it, it does seem like it was very quiet. It was a very quiet time, and the moon was, was full and bright, and you just expect all these little critters to be running around and, and everything, and they just didn't. That also was something that I felt would be noteworthy to think about here. And I asked him also if he would mind describing what he saw. He did tell me that it was on two legs, ran very swiftly, just like a human, except much faster. When it was running on two legs and then it dropped down into four and ran almost like um, almost like you would expect a big predator, like a, a, a cougar or a wolf or something like that to run, some type of big predator like that. So I believe what he says afterwards is... He, the way that he puts it is that 
his feet didn't touch the tree stand getting out. He was going so fast getting out of that tree stand to get back to his truck that he doesn't remember getting back to the truck. So it was so fast, and he was pretty terrified and really spooked and really offset by this that his first thought was just to get back to the truck, get back to the truck. Now, it takes my daddy, it takes a lot to get him out of the tree stand. Once he's up there, he wants to stay. He wants to see, you know, like I said, we've been hunters forever, and he wants to sit up there until a little bit later in the day. So for him to get down is a big deal. For him to really be spooked enough to get down. Now, I'm thinking, and I talked to him about it yesterday, well, what were you thinking if, if this thing was running at you, almost directly at you, and you got down out of the tree stand, you know, did you, were you scared to, you know, get down? What, what were you thinking? Because I would have probably been too scared to move. And he says that his first just instinctual thought was just to get back to his truck and get out of there. So he just had an overwhelming sense of fear just hit him and he knew that that meant that he needed to get out of there said so he couldn't sit there any longer after he woke up you know got shaken out of that shock that he was in so he couldn't sit there any longer he felt the need just to get down and get out of there get back to his truck and fire out of there says he ran like lightning it was a Sunday. You know, I always thought that he told this story just to kind of prevent us from wanting to hunt on Sundays. But after hearing him tell it so much, and when I take my friends hunting, I'll say, you know, Daddy, tell, tell so-and-so about this, this experience. And he tells it the same way every time, every single time. Now, he says what he saw didn't have, it was not as small as a coyote. It was very large. Very dark color, had very um, more pointed ears, almost like uh, a Doberman ears, and it had a very long snout. It looked in the face much like what you'd expect a Doberman to look like, except much larger. And I thought that was something to point out because I've heard other people describe it as looking kind of like a Doberman, you know, just a thicker coat. And that type of thing. And that's what I would expect. But I started looking up pictures and videos, information, especially this year is when I've started kind of diving into it, trying to figure out exactly what he saw. And I'll, I'll get around to why I've started looking that up this season a lot more later. But that is essentially his story. And he'll tell it the same way every time. You know, he got back to his truck. He drove out of there. And he has, and I can say this for a fact, has never went hunting on a Sunday on a full moon ever again. Not ever again. I think full moons, we still go out and we go hunting because it is a good time to hunt. But he has never been hunting on a Sunday morning ever again. I don't know why he has put those two together. I don't know if he thinks that it was just a Sunday morning thing or he was trying to find reasoning for seeing what he saw. But the most interesting thing is that that's not the only sighting that we've had on our hunting property. If, if that were a one-time case, I think that I'd be a little more skeptical, honestly. And if I hadn't had my own encounter, I'd be a little more skeptical. But my dad, again, my dad has had another experience, which spooks me out a lot because it's near the place where I like to hunt the most. So he had that happen. It was Sunday full moon. He saw the creature come barreling towards him. And he didn't hear it after that. I don't think that the creature noticed him at all. I think that he was up there long enough that everything had kind of quieted down. And he was very still. He was way off the ground. I don't think that the creature noticed that he was there. I think that the creature was in pursuit of, of these two deer for a, food, for a food source or something like that. And I don't think it noticed it, uh, but he definitely noticed it. And I believe that story with all of my heart because he will tell it to you over and over the same way. Now, the second story also comes from my dad. 
and it comes from the other hunting property that we have, which is the lane. And I told you about the lane. The lane goes all the way back about a half a mile. So that lane is, is like a dirt road. And it has that, that uh, growth on both sides. It's very high up. And so, you know, it's, it's creepy walk if you're walking in the dark. I've had a few times where I've been walking in the dark down that, that path by myself and just been, just felt terror and just like, uh, just a fear that I couldn't, I couldn't recognize where it's coming from. So my dad and my uncle, my great uncle, which is his uncle, we'll call him Randy. My, my uncle Randy and my dad were sitting at the end of this lane, which is near the road. We have like a gate. They're sitting near the gate and it's really, really late at night. Probably or right as the, the sun had fully set and they're, shining a spotlight, you know, down the lane just to see. They've got their rifles, but they're not actually hunting or anything. They're just kind of sitting there talking, just kind of chatting it up and, and shining the spotlight just to see if anything, you know, if they see any big deer run across that, that lane or anything like that. And, you know, they're both the same way. They were raised, you know, working in farms and fields and not really superstitious at all, you know, other than being of the Christian faith and, and believing in that they're not out there looking for anything supernatural. They're just out there looking for deer, you know, just sitting there talking because it's, it's just a, a random night. Now this, this night, there was nothing special about it. It wasn't, you know, a full moon. It wasn't any type of day. I, I don't think he remembers what day it was. He just will tell you that it was later on in the night when the sun was down and he was just shining the spotlight, big spotlight down this lane. His uncle and him were just sitting there talking. They were just chatting and, all of a sudden, and my uncle, actually, before he passed away a couple of years back, he would tell you the same thing. Him and my dad would tell you the same exact story. Even if you separated them and asked him about it, tell you the same story. So they were sitting there chatting and said that they saw the brush about maybe midways down this lane, starting to look like it was being moved something was trying to come out of that brush and cross the lane you know so of course he thinks oh it's a deer so he shines the spotlight down this this lane and he just says all right let's let's look for this big buck i bet you money there's a big buck about to come out of this field you know of course it doesn't have any crops or anything in it. it's just a lot of growth you know younger trees and stuff like that but it is very thick the growth, the grass, and everything is, is very tall and very thick. And there's also a ditch there, too, a really deep ditch. But he says he's shining the spotlight down this lane waiting for, you know, this thing to come out. And this this takes maybe, it all happens in about 10 seconds. He says they're, they're watching and they're quiet. They're really quiet and they're watching down this lane. And he says, him and Michael both, says that something big, again, very dark in color with kind of like the eye shine is like a like a dark yellow almost an orange that reflects back to them and this thing is just giant he said it's just massive it's it's bigger than any panther it's bigger than any black bears we don't have black bears in the state but he said it's bigger than any he's ever seen this thing comes out just on four legs and scales this ditch I mean, just scales it one one big jump and it's over the ditch and runs across the lane into the other the other side of growth. And the way that he tells it is he sat there and looked at my uncle. They they looked back at each other after they saw it. And they both were very quiet. Just same kind of shock that he experienced when he was in the tree stand and saw the creature crossing the field towards him. So they just sat there and looked at each other just in shock. And my dad looks at my uncle and says, what the bleep was that? What was that? And my uncle looks back at him and says, I don't know. I, ha I have no idea. So they sat there in just silence and just stared with that light pointed straight out down that lane. Just in complete silence, just awestruck by what they'd just seen. Because like I told you before, my dad has had an encounter like this previously. 
which is just it's, it's scary to think about because you know, now he's seeing this on another on another area not far from where he saw it the first time and if he wasn't convinced the first time he was convinced this time because here he is and he's seeing it a second time he's got another person with him who has seen the same thing that he's seen now my uncle had written off whatever my dad said previously he just said oh you were just you're just seeing stuff in the field it was still dark you were just you know you're just seeing stuff don't worry about it it was just like a hallucination or something and the darkness was just getting to your eyes you were probably creeped out anyway but my uncle and he would tell you this before he passed away he would say oh yeah no i saw whatever whatever your dad saw whatever we saw that night i saw, I saw it run across that path and it scared the daylights out. now this, this is a this is important because this is a place i like to hunt down this lane in the tree stand in this lane i love to hunt there one of my favorite i've killed a big buck in there this year you know of course i I still have that kind of iffy feeling every time I go out there, but it's almost like we've never heard of anyone getting attacked in this area. If this dog man is out there, which I'm sure it still is, it has to be. And I'll tell you why I think that it's still out there later, but this thing's still out there. You know, it's been seen by more people have seen this thing who have hunted on our property before. You know, my dad's had friends who have come to him after, you know, being in the tree stand, like, hey, I don't know how to tell you this, but I saw something. And they would talk about it, and they all come up with the same, you know, very similar descriptions of what they've seen. It's been a very large dog-like animal that has, you know, the same kind of haunches that, like, a regular dog has. And it's very large very dark color has that kind of orange yellowish eye shine if you were to shine a light on it or you know in the headlights or something like that people have seen this creature cross the road in their headlights in their vehicles before back near our property um, i have told my dad about it people have have seen it in their hunting when they've been hunting during the you know at night i haven't heard of any sightings during the day but i have heard of a lot of them at night i believe there was one time during the day where someone says they were driving along that road it's a long stretch of road just forest on both sides and have seen something similar kind of come out of the field and kind of turn around and go back the way that it came instead of crossing you know stopped and looked at them and then went back into the field and i think that's crazy because i'm thinking now is there just one of them out there is there more than one is there a group of them are we seeing the same ones or the same one over and over you know and this has been over a span of what 30 years that there have been these crazy unexplainable occurrences and I'm thinking, are, are we seeing the same thing? Is there more than one? Are they reproducing? Is this something that we need to be concerned with? But we've never heard of anybody get attacked by these things. That's the thing. Nobody's ever had any where they felt like they were, their life was at risk. Nothing ever, anything like that. Now, I've always been a big believer. If people have seen it, over and over and over again like bigfoot that type of thing then there's something out there that we're seeing it's not just a giant group of people all over the world who are seeing these things and are you know they're just they're just hallucinating i, I don't believe that i believe that there are things out there who just they just don't want to be seen they don't want to be noticed they don't want to be found out they want to be left alone and they are also have some sort of a human uh, mindset so they're able to think they're intelligent they know that they need to stay away from humans kind of separate themselves and stay hidden you know they know that it's it's for the best for them and they know how to do it i, I believe that this is a big world 
there's a lot of places that we haven't even explored, a lot of forest and a lot of just a lot of places that we haven't seen. We don't know every creature that's out there. And all of these sightings, all these people seeing these different things, whether it's a dog man or a Bigfoot, they're not just seeing those. You know, they're not just it's not just a mistaken identity. I, I, I don't believe that. Because if that were the case, you know, we wouldn't be hearing about it. It wouldn't be something that comes up over and over and over again. And that's how I explain what I think to other people. Say so there's no way there, that we're seeing the same things over and over again. And it's all just mistaken identity or just like a have heard black bear with mange or something. It, it's not all that. It just can't be. And I refuse, refuse to believe that just because I am a nature lover. I'm an animal lover. I have a great respect for nature and the outdoors. And I spent a lot of time still to this day. I spent a lot of time outdoors. And I just have a big respect for it. And I just know that if something were out there and it had a, a human mindset and it was able to plan and kind of decide when it goes out and, you know, it's keeping out of the sight of the majority of the population, there's a reason for it. As to where they came from or where this one on our land, if it's just, like I said, I don't know if it's just one or multiple, where they came from, why they're there. But I haven't ever heard of, of any life-threatening experiences. Now, that's me saying I've never heard of one. There could be, but I feel like with how close our community is and most of my family lives in that area, like we would have heard of it. But I have never heard of, of any life-threatening encounters with, with whatever this thing is. So with all that being said, I have had one of the scariest moments of my life, and it was on our hunting land. And it has a lot to do with what my dad and my uncle and other family members around this area have seen. I am a firm believer now that whatever's out there is there, still there. And I say that because last year, around the beginning of deer season, I had my own experience. Now, of course, I didn't come straight up face to face with this dog man. And I and I firmly believe that the dog man, no Bigfoot or anything like that, it had all the same features. That's a common trait among these stories is all the same features. You know, the pointed ears, kind of tufts of hair at the, the end, the broad shoulders, the large size, kind of, uh, I've heard anything from Doberman to like pit bull kind of face with the longer snout, the, the yellow orange. I like. Uh, the same kind of stance, the long arms kind of, I've heard anything from like finger hands with, with actual fingers to like claw curved claws. Anybody who's had a real up close encounter has been able to tell me, you know, we've heard all roughly the same thing. It's all been roughly about the same kind of thing. That's what makes me wonder, you know, is there more out there? Well, anyway, on with my story. Now, this was last year. It was still warm, so I would say it was the beginning of the deer season. And I sometimes like to go over to the other place where we hunt because the very back stands one of the best places in the area to hunt, undoubtedly. We have killed and seen some of the biggest bucks we've ever had on this property back there. Not a lot of people go back there to hunt that area just because it's so far off the road and not many people know about it. Plus, the place that it is located on, the, the land that it's located on, is gated off. So you have to have a key to get in. And as of last year, there were only maybe four or five people who had keys to this land or to this entrance in order to get in to go back there. But last year I had my own key, so I loated up my rifle. Uh, 30-06 uh, rifle, a Zeiss scope, 
you know, I love that thing. And you, know, you could see very clearly out of that scope. But I always keep some binoculars on me just so I don't have to pick up the rifle every time I want to look. Well, I went out one, I believe it was a, it was a morning. Yeah, because I had left, I lived towards the center of the state, more towards Columbia now. Um, so my hometown is roughly an hour and a half drive. So I would, if I go hunting in the mornings, I leave around three thirty, four o'clock to get there uh, in time before the sun comes up. So I get settled, like I told you before. So I do remember leaving very early that morning. It was just me. My dad didn't go with me. It was it was just me. I just wanted to go out there. You know, I'd had a rough couple of weeks at work, and I said, you know, I just, I want to go hunting. This is the beginning of the season. I don't think I had been that last year. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't been at all up until that point. So I said, you know, I finally got a a day off. I believe it was a Saturday morning because I had a, a Saturday off, which doesn't happen very often. And I said, okay, it's a Saturday morning. I want to go hunting. I've got my buck tags. Nobody's really been out here to hunt yet because it's so early in the season. It's hot. We've got mosquitoes the size of, you know, your hand out there flying around. A lot, not a lot of people go out there that early because it's just miserable. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to go out there and get a head start on everybody else. I bet you nobody's even set foot in here since they did the field pots in the summer. I get out here and get a good head start on everybody else. And on my field cameras, I've been seeing a really nice book. But it was on the back stand with the land that had the three stands on it. It was on that back stand where I had that camera. And every time I go out there, even if I'm not by myself, I'm thinking about this thing that my dad has told me about. You can't help but think about it. This is the same tree stand that he saw it in. You know, you're in the same place that he saw it in. It's a morning, an early morning, same time that he saw it. You know, it's always in the back of your mind. It's not something that I don't like to live constantly in fear. It's just not something I enjoy doing. I would rather push it to the back of my mind and go out there and have a good time hunting and just not sit there and, and let it prevent me from going and doing something I love to do. You know, even if it's just something that's in the back of my mind, that wasn't personal. It didn't happen to me personally. I didn't want it to, to, you know, ruin my love of, of hunting and the outdoors. And to this day, I, I still have it. It's still something that I respect in nature. And I, the way that I see it is if I respect it, it's going to respect and it's going to stay away from it. If I respect this space, I don't know what makes me feel like that, but it's just the way that I feel. So I've already set up the mood for the encounter on that back property in the back field where that tree stand is. And I wasn't thinking about it too much. You know, I was a little bit nervous because I was out there hunting on. You know, there was nobody else hunting on that land, like I said, at this point. It's just me. So I drive back there. I drop down the path. It's still very, very dark, very dark. But I'm thinking, okay, let me just get out here and get a good head start on everybody else. It'll be fine. And let me just put this in the back of my head and not think about it. Because if I dwell on it, I'm going to freak myself out. <laughs> it's just something that I do. As long as I'm not sitting there constantly thinking about it and overthinking it and, and dwelling on it, then it's not going to bother me as much. But if I sit there and dwell on it, you know, if I sat there that day and, and, and thought about it and dwelled on it, I probably would have gotten in my car and drove an hour and a half back home. That's just, that's just what it is. But this day, you know, I said, I'm just going to go. And I just pushed it to the very back of my head. Didn't think about it. You know, and I, like I've said before, I'm in law enforcement. I see terrible things a lot. Um, you know, I work in a very big county, so I've seen everything you think of, I think, just about at this point. So not a lot really surprises me or really pushes my buttons much anymore. But uh, last year, you know, as I pulled my, my Jeep up, 
I have not a Wrangler, but just another type of off-road Jeep. I pull it up to this area where the woods are. You have to walk through and follow the beer cans, like I said before. So I pull up there. You know, I sit in my, my Jeep, and I'm getting my things together. I'm getting all my equipment together, getting my gun, getting it loaded. I carry my uh, 9 millimeter pistol on my side and a holster. You know, I load it, make sure it's on, you know, safety. It's on my size clipped on. I carry a backpack with my binoculars and scent eliminator and that kind of stuff in it. Put it on my back. And I'm sitting there, and I'll sit there before I get out and, and start walking. Maybe sit there in my car, roll down the window a little bit, and, and smoke a cigarette before I start walking. Well, this day, and I remember it very clearly, because I was already feeling a little bit weird whenever I got to this place. I don't know if it was because I knew I was out there on my own or what what the feeling was, but I just had kind of like that weird feeling almost a dread just kind of trickling in from the back of my mind just kind of making its way to the forefront and i'm constantly just sitting there trying to think of other things I'm scrolling through my phone while i'm sitting there but the, the strangest thing that i remember about that morning is it wasn't cloudy you look up and see the stars it's a beautiful night but what i remember sitting there and thinking was is i don't hear a lot and I, this this worries me because it's the same thing that my dad said that night or that morning when he saw the um, creature come out of the field, the exact same field that I'm on. And he said the same thing. He didn't really hear much. And I've always heard that you can always tell if there's a predator around, if all the other animals and everything get real quiet. That just means that there's something, there's a predator around. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's really strange. It's unheard of to sit out here at this time of the year and not at least hear some crickets or some owls hooting off in the, but it was eerily silent. And I don't think that since this day that I've been back and heard absolute silence, I can't recall the time that I have been back since and heard that kind of deafening silence. It's almost like when you hear that quietness come up when it's just completely void of all noise, that's scarier on its own because you're thinking, okay, I know I'm surrounded by these little critters and, and these other animals, why are them not making any noise? And that's the only thing I can think of is, is okay, you know, I'm trying not to think of a predator being in the area. I want to get out and go get in the tree stand before the sun starts to break. So, you know, I'm a little bit hard-headed, I will say. I've always been. Just pushed it to the back of my head. I said, you know, I've got my, my rifle. I've got my pistol. I feel a little bit safer with those on me. I do it in my work, too. I can admit that there have been times, you know, as an officer, whenever I'm out on the land or, or I'm out, you know, in the streets or whatever, and I'm feeling a little bit more self-assured because I've got my weapon, you know, that's like a little, almost like a little safety blanket, I will say, but you have to know how to handle yourselves in situations like that. So I've kind of learned whenever I get that eerie, kind of scared feeling to kind of just push it to the back of my head. It's just something that comes natural to me now. So that's what I did this, this morning. Just kind of pushed it to the back of my head, didn't let it sit there and simmer in my thoughts or I was going to, like I said, I'd get in my car and go home <laughs> if I let it come to the forefront. So, as I said, I was parked back there behind the, the woods and I decide finally get out of the car, still not hearing anything, not hearing any, any noises. And that should have probably been like a big, a big red flag for me but i just kind of brushed it off I was like let me just go get the tree stand i'll be okay once i'm up in the tree once you're up in the tree stand it's just a little bit more of a feeling of security you know so i said all right let me go uh, get in the tree stand i'll feel better and so i got out and there's about a 20 foot walk 
to the ditch from where I'm, where I'm parked to the ditch to where the plywood board is, is laid across it where we can walk across the ditch into the forested area. I'm walking across and I can't, this, this feeling is just bugging me, it's sitting in the back of my head, it's driving me crazy, but I'm still pushing on. I just keep thinking, just let me get up in the tree saying I'll feel better. So I have the rifle strapped across my shoulder, got my pistol, my backpack on, phone in my pocket, everything. And uh, I get out, start walking across this path. Now, the path goes on down past this forested area. It goes on on down, but you walk across the plank in order to get to that tree stand. You don't go any further than that. Um, I'm not really sure what's down that road. I've never been down past the place where the tree stand is because I've never really had any reason to. Uh, we've done a little bit of bush hogging back there, but that's about it. So I look down the path, you know, I'm just looking around me, trying to get aware, just stay aware of my surroundings. It's, it's something that I do everywhere I go. I'm much more comfortable once I'm aware of everything going on around me. And I'm still noticing there's not a lot of, there's no, no animal noise around me. Nothing's really making any noise other than I, I wear these thick snake boots, especially during that time of year. Snakes are prevalent by there. So I've got these these huge snake roots on them, and the only sound that's really coming, you know, into focus for me is the sound of my boots, and I'm, you know, crunching across the path there. I get across the board for the ditch, and when you walk through the woods, you don't step on these beer cans that are laid out for you to find your way to the tree stand. You don't step on them. You just kind of follow them. They're just kind of a lead through the forested area. You don't have to step on them or anything. So I just kind of follow them. And as I'm following them through the woods, I notice, like I said, the only sound I really hear is my boots, just the, the crunch, the thud. Every now and then my the toe of my boot will hit a, a branch in front of me or something like that. And I remember walking. I hadn't been walking for five minutes. Not even that. But I do remember hearing a noise from behind me. What made me, what made my, the alarms in my head go off instantly was the fact that I had walked up along these beer camps and I had heard a loud kind of two step, like a thud behind me, like something had just, jumped and landed almost on the ground. But what really threw me off was the fact that I heard one of the beer cans get crunched. You know, when you step on something like that and you hear that kind of crunch, that, that's what I heard, except it, it was followed by another foot or uh, maybe another mat. Like a, it, it sounded like two feet, and one of them had just hit the beer can when it thudded down. And that made me stop dead in my tracks. I don't think I've felt a fear or just an energy like that run through my body ever in my life. I remember it just completely stopped me in my tracks. And I was, every sense I had, everything was just, just like alarms going off in my body. And I'm staying completely still, I'm barely breathing. And I'm just standing there, just, just waiting. And I don't hear it. I, I sit there and I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe maybe I just heard something. Maybe something just knocked the can over. And I'm trying to tell myself these things so that I can just buck up and keep going, you know. And I take a couple more steps. And I remember hearing another set of steps, another couple of thuds. Now, this was it taking a couple more steps. It wasn't just jumping down and landing this was it taking some steps and it hit another one of the beer cans that was that was on the ground and that's whenever it solidified things for me that's when things got real i said okay if i thought i was hearing things before i'm not now again stopped dead in my tracks kind of unclipped took my thumb and unclipped my pistol 
where the, the holster had it clipped in, kind of unclipped it. And I'm sitting there staring straight ahead. I don't even turn around. I think my body, everything in me was telling me not to turn around. I'm not sure if I know why, but it was just kind of like an instinct that I had just to stand completely still, almost like Jurassic Park where they, they see the T-Rex and they're like, if you stand still, it, it, it won't see you. And for some reason, I guess that's my body trying to just be invisible. I stood absolutely still. And I, and I wait, and maybe 10 seconds later, I hear it again. It sounds closer, which alarmed me, and it sounded heavy. That's all, I, that's all I really know is it was heavy, and it was closer. And it had, it, was, it couldn't have been 15 feet behind me at this point, whenever I heard it again. And that, I mean, just the signals that my body's given off, I couldn't move. And then I heard it again, a couple of steps. It sounded like th like thuds. Whatever was making these steps was heavy. I've seen huge deer. I've heard them moving around the forest. This was no deer. This was this was something bigger than a human had to be. You know, it sounded almost it sounded heavier than my boots when they were walking across the ground. Just thud, just big thuds. Almost like whenever you jump across a, a ditch or something and you land, that kind of thud that that hits the ground like that and heard it a couple more times before or behind me and I'm noticing that it's getting a little bit closer and that's whenever body just goes into full panic mode instead of standing there completely still in shock I take off my tree stand to start running and I'm running these boots terrified that I'm going to get my boots snagged on a root or something and get snagged up. But I'm I'm just lifting my feet up higher and I'm just running. I've got a rifle on my shoulder, everything, and I'm I've got my backpack on and I'm still running full speed ahead, following these beer cans. Just I just to myself I'm thinking, let me just make it to the tree stand. I finally reach the edge of the field where I get to the, the tree stand. For some reason, I decide to look behind me. Just a quick glance. I don't know why. <laughs> I sometimes wish that I wouldn't have, and I would have just climbed up the tree stand as quickly as I could. But I just kind of turned my head a little bit, almost just like out of my peripheral vision, and that's when I see just a mass. And you can make out, something that's darker than the trees and the woods behind it if it's standing in front of it. You know, you can see the silhouette. I just saw the silhouette. Kind of outside of uh, almost like it's hanging out beside a tree, but behind it, you know, kind of sticking its body out. And I see these thick, just thick arms and it's brightly like that orange hue, and I've got a little head flashlight on. I forgot to mention that, and it's on low, so really low beam. So whenever I look back to my peripheral, it just barely glints off the eyes, and I see this this massive silhouette, same little pointed ears with the tufts of hair, and immediately I'm thinking, I don't know if this thing is going about to get me. I don't know. I don't think I've ever, I've never experienced fear like that. And I have been in some sticky situations, big, some crazy situations where I have been afraid for my life or for somebody else's life. But this situation right here had me absolutely horrified. I mean, I'm looking at this thing and it's not really registering. You know, I'm thinking at the same time to what my dad has seen in this exact same place. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, th this is, this is what I, this is what my dad has seen. Same place. And it's all just kind of like a, like a, such a quick thought. These, all these thoughts just kind of burst through my head all at the same time. 
But then there's another part of me who says, get up in the tree now. Get up in the tree. Like, you can't stand here and stare at this thing out of your peripherals. You've got to get up there. So I turn my head back away from this thing. My face is hot. I can feel myself sweating. I'm, I'm getting a little nervous. Not a lot. So I climb up this tree. Now it's like a like a ladder, like an uh, wrought iron ladder leads up to this tree. Sound. I get up at just as fast. As I, I don't think I've ever climbed up a tree stand that fast in my life. I remember I get to the top. I'm like, um, I can't hardly breathe. I'm there's a little part. There's a little bit of like I'm crying or sobbing, but it's like very quiet because of that panic. You know, I got this panic and it's on high alert. And I I get up there, set my rifle down, and immediately try to pull my phone out to call my dad. Because he was, you know, he was in a completely different area of working, probably two or three hours away. But I'm terrified. I have just seen this thing, just looked at it. It was not more than 10 feet away from me when I saw it. I had gotten up there. I don't know if it made any noise while I was climbing up the ladder because I was making so much noise myself. Don't know. Uh, but once I got up there, I could hear it. And the scariest thing was that I heard it around the tree stand until the sun came up. Just thuds, like it was taking a couple steps at a time around my tree stand. So sometimes it would be to the left or to the right or behind me right near the tree itself. Horrifying. And I'm sitting there trying to call my dad. Had no service. I don't usually have service out there. Sometimes it's kind of spotty. But I couldn't. And, and that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness and knowing that you're out here and you're on your own and there's something like that in between you and your vehicle. And it's dark. And you can't see and you're just hearing this stuff around you. I'm telling you, there's not a feeling like that. There's nothing to describe that feeling. Like I said, I've been in some crazy situations, but I haven't felt fear like this. And it stuck around. Now, when I think about what exactly everything else that all my other senses at this point, I'm thinking about the smell. I do distinctly remember the smell. I don't remember why, but I remember it smelled almost like like a like a, a rotten a deer that had been left out there and had rotted. That's initial. That's what I was thinking about because I've I've had that smell before where somebody thought they had missed and just left and and left the deer and the deer had died out there and I had smelled it and it smelled similar to that. If you've ever you know, if anybody's ever smelled like a dead carcass before, that's what you're smelling. And it putrid. So that's initially what I'm thinking, but it doesn't stick around after the sun comes up. So I'm believing now that it was probably related to the dog man that I saw. It had to be that smell. The noises were so loud and so pronounced. They just were thuds deep thuds and it sounded like something was just kind of circling the trees I thought now make no mistake about it if that thing wanted to get me it could have hopped up that tree stand up that ladder and tore me out of there when I was second thought I know that I knew that back then when I was sitting up there I said this thing could climb up this ladder just the way that I saw it, it was so athletically built and it was you know kind of resembled a human in its upright stance i said this thing could climb up here and snatch me out of here in a minute but it, it never did in fact i don't think it came to the tree line where i don't think it came out past the tree line because i only heard it in the woods behind me or off to the sides but i never it never came out front where the tree line opened out into the field never once but it I mean, for 30 minutes, I heard it around me different times, and each time just 
made me all the more terrified. Well, that's it for tonight's show. Thanks as always so much for listening. Have a great night. If you've had a Dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.